welcome. Um, you saw the ping, right? Most of you, some of you, we send out, I send out an alert in advance to try to tee you up a little bit. And uh, this was an amazing picture. This is actually an aircraft carrier that is, sta that is um, coming into Malta, of all places. So, you know, we, we, carrier is our model, right? That's what God released over us through a friend years ago. And he's let us develop that model. Um, that you are those planes that have come in and landed, right? And you're getting recalibrated and refueled and hopefully repaired and, and briefed and getting ready for being launched back out again. But I just saw this carrier in this very foreign port and I thought, okay, that's, that's kind of the theme here. So I'm going to connect the dots with the time and season, but then I'm going to overlay it with some of, of what I'm still trying to process through happened while we were gone. Okay. That's a particularly great picture with all those different planes. Yeah. Yeah. About 30 something planes yeah. on it. Yeah. Look at yeah. all the different kinds. Yeah. That's not including those helicopters. Okay. There's huge variety, different yeah. specialized yeah. things. Yeah. Okay. There are those, the AWACS, those are those discs that go up, right? We've talked about that. They go up and they look out 250 miles, okay? Yeah. And can see stuff from way out there from that perspective. You've got. What, you've got, you've got anti-submarine helicopters that are operating to find any, any terrain issues that are happening where you can't even see it coming. All this stuff works and coordinates together. You all have different skills and abilities. You bring that into the mix. You land here, you bring that intel, you forward it in. Just now, as we were praying over Esther, you were walking in that because you hear differently, you see differently. And what we we're looking for is the complete, right? Everyone gets something to bring in right that's how the body works together it's not a one person two person or five person show fivefold is just so that those people help to get everybody going it's not that they do it all right so some churches get moving in fivefold but then it's like those five <laughs> no it's the five help everybody get into it so anyway i'm going to do something a little different so i'm going to keep trying to go here we'll we'll see how it runs okay times and seasons right we always do this first month was about being in egypt and coming out it's paralleled of course just by chance because the passover lamb is the passover lamb and so we get parting of the red sea and the partaking of the red wine the crossing and the cross right mm -hmm. that's that first month and then we're moving on and we're looking ahead towards the third month because we know the first round that was 50 days later at Mount Sinai. The fire comes down, the presence of God. He, they hear his voice. The word gets released. Revelation comes. The third month coming up soon, 50 days after the resurrection, Pentecost, the fire comes down. They get whammied, right? And the full power throws. So there's tremendous things that happen in the next month, but we're in this time right now in between. And so I've used this picture as the hinge First month, of course, with the Passover lamb, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. Second month with revelation and the power from on high. But we're at that interesting point where those two parts are trying to link together. And they require a hinge pin. And so this is just what we've been talking about. The second month being Issachar, that anointing, right? And it is a Vav. It is the Vav month in a Vav year. Vav is the Hebrew letter that is for the number six, right? We're in the year 2016 or in the Hebraic or biblical calendar 5776. So we just pay attention to that as a prophetic trigger and say, okay, God, how might you want to point our attention? And so it's got to interconnect these two dynamics because the church has forever unhinged them. And we've gotten all caught up in the spirit sometimes and we've not really held on to this well or we've gotten this well about crucifixion, resurrection, and we're not really holding the full giftedness of the Holy Spirit. And we've got to connect them in together. And that's part of what this time is. And it allows also, though, a movement. It's not a rigid coupling. It's a hinge pin. And so I love this picture, which I gave you a couple of years ago. I wanted to bring it back because Judah is aligned with that first month. Judah is the door into the tabernacle, right? It's that door. It's got that extra dalet. It's the first month, it's for freedom, it's Judah worship and warfare, and it's a door that leads in. Judah is the front guard at that gate of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And then the rich treasury that's inside in the Issachar anointing, right? The revelation, provision, the spirit, that's Zebulun and riches that are all coming. And here is Issachar that's linking it right there in the second month. And so knowing the times and the seasons and understanding how these things come together, okay? So that's the time we are. And in the midst of that, I just pay attention to it because it's like God's saying, okay, watch how I connect things. 
And what's funny is sometimes I go and I'll want to plan stuff according to what I see God doing. Sometimes I'm just doing it and suddenly God goes, hey, by the way, pay attention to this, right? So let me back up because in November, Kim and I were talking and we have, you know, been pushing at this ministry for a while and um, there's been some challenges financially and, and all, but we kept waiting to get certain things done with the house and everything else and we just decided, you know what, we can't keep waiting and pushing off um, for everything. And so we made plans then to take Levi over to Europe because he'd never been and we wanted to expose him to that. We hadn't been in since our second wedding anniversary, I guess, when we were over. We lived over there for six months in a VW camper van and traveled around and did tremendous things for our marriage eventually. Um, no, actually, it, it, it really did because it connected us, right? You travel extended with somebody and actually live in country because we lived in various work camps um, with other volunteers around a project. Um, and so we just decided we need to do that. And lo and behold, we, we timed it according to Levi's school when he would get out. But then it landed us right in the second month, in this hinge time. And you all know me enough probably by now that I move prophetically and I've been trying to get more and more comfortable with that. But part of what I see is that God will do things. He'll have me do things or I'll just do things and then he'll debrief it later. Right? Okay. And I'm coming to understand that. He had different people do buy a piece of land when it seemed like really stupid or something like that. And you do it. So that's kind of how it's going to connect in here. And uh, I hope it makes sense because this is different than I usually do. But Kim, and I was talking with her about this, she got the word triptych. That was part of the connect. Any of you do a triptych? Yeah. I, had, I, could, I thought, I know that sounds familiar, but I can't remember what. Um, anyway, AAA does this thing called triptych. You know, where you plan your trip, you tell them where you want to go, and they used to set out this whole thing. It used to be prior GPS. I don't know if you remember. They used to actually print this little thing and you'd flip these pages. Okay, it was a trip tick, and it was really cool. It was one of the advantages of being AAA. And so that kind of connects it into that, but I want to give you this verse Psalm 84 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. Sorry, I got over the side there. Whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who set their heart on what? Pilgrimage. 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 This is really, really critical. Is there a blessing for this? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because we had gone ahead and decided and set our hearts on pilgrimage. This is us in a bus in, in Rome. Yeah. Me trying to learn how to do selfies, which is, is a new experience. It's like, okay, what am I doing, you know? Uh, you know? And, and everywhere, you know, they're trying to sell you selfie sticks and stuff like this. And it's just like, nah, I, I, you know, I just got long arms. I got my own selfie stick. Thank you. But it's like, uh, okay, where is that? I mean, the people really know what they're doing there. And it's like, okay. And you just watch people everywhere doing that. And you're like, okay. We did not do many of those, which you are, we're all be grateful for. But anyway, I was preparing the ping going, okay, God, where are you doing this? Because what happened is we spent two weeks there. We lived in apartments. Okay, that we, we found God connected the dots. We stayed in apartments because I like to live outside of the main touristy kind of stuff. Because I want to connect with the land and kind of the culture, not just see the stuff. That, that, I can only see so much stuff. That doesn't overwhelm me. And so um, that was part of it. But, but I've, I've, and I, we just completely unplugged. Okay? I even had somebody, who was it? Somebody came up to me and said, do not pray for us while you're gone. Because they know I carry that on a regular basis. I don't. Who was who said that? You know, was that you? Yeah, Carol. Don't pray for us while we're while you're on. So it's like, okay, I try not to. But it's just like you know. I mean, we just unplugged. Just kind of like, and you almost you have to. You have to to survive. To survive. You can't speak the language, and I mean, everything is more complicated than it is here. So you have to. You have to be focused in the moment. You can't be somewhere else because it's all strange. So. Here are some points that we're going to try to get across. Are you an ugly tourist or a settled homebody? Because most people will go one or the other, and there's actually a third option. Number two, fear of loss is keeping most of us under house arrest. It's why many will never go if they go to another country. How many of you traveled in a foreign country? Right? All of you. Okay. How many of you went there on some sort of guided tour where somebody had responsibility and watched it? Okay. How many of you have gone and just kind of gone and, and, and do winging it? Okay. Okay. 
Which is more challenging? Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because suddenly now you right everything goes outside of your control. And um, anyway, it's a little but a fear of loss will keep a lot of people from that. Like cruise ships, right? I do like being on a cruise ship. I like being able to travel but only unpack once. But that's not really, you know, that's it's just you're staying very isolated. You always got your protected buffer and you're not engaging in it. And that was not how we wanted to try to connect Levi to it. Googling God and why this will be the norm. Some of you are not sure what that means. We'll try to get that, okay? Those of you who traveled and we get it, do you know? The danger in where we seek God and why, there's a danger there. These are just things that God pressed on me. Only one man need to question at each and every major transition. I'll tell you what that was and why. How we need saints and where we need them. Okay, these are just kind of like the tricky balance to honor your history, but don't be trapped by it. And then finally, God's warped sense of humor. He's playing with you. Okay, you got all these? Okay, now I'm going to try because the upside as a stranger in a foreign land. There is an upside to, under, to going into a foreign land. Now, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect sojourners scattered throughout the provinces. This is his word to you as elect. You're supposed to be a sojourner. You're supposed to be in a foreign land. It shifts how you operate. It changes how you live and work. And if we're not pressing into a foreign land all the time in some dimension in the spirit, we're probably being disobedient. Just telling you. Because of this, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. We are called out to be different, right? And we've got a place and time where that's continuing to happen. So when you travel, it really gets magnified if you will actually live in the land rather than just sort of pop around. You have to pay attention to the now, where you are and what's happening, right? You could ignore some of that when you're here, right? You drive down, how many of you use a GPS to go to the grocery store? You're like, oh, come on, right? You're not gonna do that, right? Why not? You know it so well. In fact, the problem is sometimes you get to the grocery store and you can't remember getting there, right? Because your brain was off and we don't know that there are three people under the bus somewhere because you just drove right over them, right? Isn't that scary? You get somewhere and you're like, I don't remember actually, right? Or you plan to go somewhere and you end up going into default and you end up somewhere else because you're just so, right? We come accustomed to it in our habits and so we stop engaging, okay? You need to connect the dots with your walk with Jesus in the same way. Right? When everything's familiar and, oh yeah, it's always this and it's three hymns and do that. And, it, you know, we just, let's see, and what do I got to do after, ch you know, and if you would just get this sermon over, then I could get this part and go, right? How many people are in the pews going through that? Gosh, and you know, if Dallas trades this guy over to, you know, right? Come on. Oh, wait, did I leave that stove on or was it coffee? Right. Okay. Anyway. Number two. You have to learn to embrace discomfort. You can't travel and try to stay comfortable all the time in a foreign land. You have to embrace the discomfort because if you do, you'll get over it and you'll deal with it and you'll move through it. You keep fighting it. Okay, are you, you're going to connect the dots in the spirit here. Mm -hmm. You have to be more dependent on your navigational tools. This is part of the challenge with most of the, our walks with Jesus, right? Even that gets to be routine. Our prayers get to be routine. Our reading gets to be routine. We're showing up certain places good. <laughs> Sorry, that was God. That wasn't you. You're still trying to pretend you're awake. God's like, okay, I'm just so bored with this. <laughs> okay, sorry. So, I don't know if you can see this very well or not, but see that circle? That is where our apartment was. This is a Google Maps thing of Rome. There's Vatican City. Then you got these others, the, the Roman Forum, the Colosseum, the Pantheon, the Trevi Fountain, the Spanish Steps, kind of all the main things that you know, right? That's kind of the stuff. And part of the way that you use, how many of you use Google Maps at some point? Okay, good part of you, good. Okay, so it's, it's how many of you have smartphones? Smartphones. 
Okay. How many of you use all their functionality? How many of you are fearful that your phones are smarter than you are? All of you are right, but uh, that's okay. Fortunately, God did not send a laptop. He sent his son. So, um, so you're, o you're okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but you'd be better about plugging in all the time so you get charged. So anyway, okay. We just got to stop that. Okay, so this is a screen over here that I know most of the time where you can put in your location then put in where you want to go, right? And it will show you, but there's some contingencies here. So let's just go ahead and put it in. As in the natural, so also in the spirit. Because you have the equipment and the software that's the same as Google Maps, right? And here and here, what do you know? Connected right into the month we're about to walk into, the revelation and the Holy Spirit that allows you to plug in. But just like your phone, do you know your phone has an on-off on the GPS, right? Because it drains battery. But what happens when the GPS is lit up? What's it doing? What's it communicating with? Satellites, yeah, usually at least three satellites. Things that are high up in the heavens. Oh, what do you know? Okay, right? And they're coordinating and triangulating where you are. Because one of the first things you can do on that location thing up there in that top right is you can either tell it where you are, which you might be right or you might be wrong. Or you can put it and just say, my location, it'll tell you where you are and show you. Connect the dots spiritually. Part of the problem of getting where we need to be is we never hit the GPS and go, okay, God, you need to show me where I am right now. Because that's really scary. John Eldridge is an author who writes to men. It's one of my favorites and one of my mentors. Not that we've, I've only met him once, but um, it's just by what he writes. But he says one of the scariest questions that any man can ever ask his wife is, okay, so how are we doing? <laughs> Most men would rather have a root canal than go down that open avenue, okay? Do you understand? That, that's often the same. With, did you ever do that with God? Okay, God, how are we doing? What's my location here? Ping. Right? Turn on the GPS. Get your location. So, you have to turn it on to get the location correct. Number two, when you travel, you need to know what your next goal is. Where am I going? Where do I want to be? Okay? Now, when we were at Rome, we figure out a location, we just, a lot of times, just hit that location. <laughs> okay, let it find me, because I'm really not sure. I'm a stranger in a strange land. Again, the danger spiritually is a lot of times, oh, but I know all this. One of the biggest dangers, today we're going to be preaching on Mark, da, 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 da. Oh, I know this. <clears throat> Probably not. Right? But that quick dismissal, oh, no, I know where I am. Okay. So. We need to know, though, what's the next goal? Where do you want to be by the Holy Spirit next month? What is the location? Like, we knew we wanted to go to see uh, the Sistine Chapel, right? So we put that in. And the amazing thing is, is that when you do that, it will give you options. It will say by car, transit, or walking. And so then now you have a decision to make because each one of those involves different amounts of energy, and different amount of monetary cost. Okay, so part of what we have to know is you have to decide what you're willing to give up to get to that location. God, I really want to move more in signs and wonders. Okay, and how are you going to get there? How are you going to walk there? Or are you going to pay someone else who can help take you part of the way? Either via a bus or in a taxi. Do you understand? I'm just connected dots. Okay. These are all things because we're all over Rome trying to find our way around. A lot of times it's okay, wait a minute. Levi's going, Dad, did you double check our location? Yeah, we're here, we're going this way. And we walk a few things, and all of a sudden it's going this way. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, wait a minute, let me turn around, right? Constantly pinging with that. When you're in a very foreign land, you stay very connected in, right? Mm -hmm. When you're in very foreign spiritual territory, you'll stay much more connected in. When you think, oh, I got this, yeah. it always works this way. Right? Gail had to change some things that she'd been doing a certain way for years, and God said, nah, 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 nah. Kudos to Gail for hearing that, right? Because again, it's, I told you this line again. For most men, right? 
Give a boy a hammer and the whole world is a nail. <laughs> we sign something that works. Whack. Whack. Come on, right? Okay. We're the same way in the spirit. Hey, if that worked well last time and I prayed this way and that happened, can you imagine the poor disciples? Well, we found this blind guy and we spit and made mud and put it in his eyes and all he did is got ticked off at us. What happened to that? Oh, boy. Okay, father, father, father. Right? I mean, just constantly they were... I mean, okay. So, and you'll need to check your progress as you go. You tracking this? Making sense? This is just stuff that God was pressing on me as, as we were as we were over there. And I'm, I'm going to actually show you some of the things. But I want to show you this too. Be aware as you move into stuff that things can be surprising as you go. I made an arrangement to rent this apartment I found through TripAdvisor, a whole other story. But we pulled up, and can you see this picture on the left? Oh, no. I hadn't looked at that. That was the front. <laughs> and I'm like, oh boy. Oh boy, okay. Lessons, sometimes how you expect things aren't going to be as they are. Sometimes you have to suspend judgment though because when you step through, you see that little green door right there? Okay, that's a little private door. And when you step through that, well, then maybe eventually this will go. Oh, there it is, okay. You step into this. This is the apartment we rented. This is a little cottage that's back there. One bedroom kind of off this uh, half step to the right and one upstairs. And this top thing there was a balcony and you can kind of see what the neighbor is, okay? And so you, you kind of have to walk with, and this became our little refuge. And in the back there, you can see the garden. What was in the garden there, Kim? It was a whole wall of star jasmine across the back. We just took down a whole wall of star jasmine across our balcony right here. And there was a lemon tree in a pod. And we have a lemon tree in a pod. And there were all these sago palms on the side. And we all these sago We're like, what's happening here? It was really something to walk out there. So in a foreign land, God was directing our steps and giving us a home base. And, and we rented this apartment for a week for probably a third of what it cost us to rent an up, you know, kind of upscale hotel somewhere downtown in the touristy garbage. And this was, now we had to walk, but we probably walked over 100 miles in the, in the couple of weeks, I'm sure at least, because we walked a lot. Okay, are you just, I want you to understand in the spirit as you're moving into unknown turf, God will work it out. Don't freak out sometimes when you see the front <laughs> way it looks. Oh no! And you know, we got there at midnight on that night, so it's dark. And I'm seeing the graffiti. <laughs> I'm like, uh, we get the wrong address. Yeah. Okay. So we sat up on that balcony and we would drink cappuccino that we learned how to make ourselves and we studied the book of Romans because we were in Rome. Oh. It was just so wonderful. Oh. Okay. But that is about as spiritual as we got, you see. Oh. <laughs> hey, we slept. We ate pasta. You know, we had a lot of, not ice cream, a lot of gelato. Gail's word to us was eat lots of gelato. So we tried to submit. Okay, so let me just show you some of my pictures because you really have to go, right, certain places and you'll just see some images. You know what this is, right? What is this? Okay, the Vatican specifically? Where? St. Peter's. Okay, so this huge, huge cathedral in the back, right? There are saints all the way around there. There are 140 cast sa or chiseled saints around the top that you see there. Okay, do you know where this was built? Where? Yeah, this was built on Nero, Nero's Circus, where often there were the reason they built it here was because of the number of believers who were martyred here. Mm -hmm. They weren't actually; they believed they weren't actually martyred in the Colosseum. There were very few that were martyred there. Most of them were martyred here. And that's why they set it here. And Peter is everywhere. When you go up here, there's a, there's a statue on the far side over there to Paul. And then Peter's over back here behind this. So you go there and it's impressive to see all around. You have all these pictures of the Vatican stuff, right? When people, when they're electing the new Pope and the Pope's out there giving that stuff. And so this is where he would be and specifically up there in the top of that balcony. 
So you're in the thick of that and you're just getting pressed in because there's years of history and culture and tradition and then you walk inside and it's, it's huge and it's vast and it's crowded and there's a lot of gold. And it's oppressive. It is impressive. Oppressive. oppressive. Okay, because there's so much stuff going on. And people are having profound religious experience while we're there. We're standing there in the back watching, I'm taking some pictures, and the guy comes and just lays down right on the marble. Mm -hmm. And lays himself out in a cross position, and you know, turns himself left and right and guesses, and the other one was just standing there and crying. So people are encountering the Lord. But I'm just kind of distracted. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff. But when you go and you look up, because everything is trying to draw your eye, you know, in this way, upwards, into the vaults, into the domes, and they're amazing. And they draw you, and the paintings are stunning. Okay? Kim, just tell them about when you were there, and oops, I'm trying to go back. I just, did, I've go. been wanting to go to the Vatican for forever. And I, when I walked through the door of St. Peter's, I was overcome by how dark and oppressive it was. I, I was like, it's like it was void of the Spirit of God. But as soon as I crossed the threshold and felt that, I felt this physical feeling. It's like I had a pit, like I was a peach and had a pit in the middle of me. The Spirit of God became this physical thing I had never felt before. I felt the manifestation of God on me when the Spirit falls on me and I'm ministering, but it had never been this way before. And I walked, we spent hours, and I walked all over with this big thing in the middle of me, just walking the Spirit of God everywhere through that, through that huge cathedral. Now, I know there were other people there that were Spirit-filled. Maybe they had the same experience. But Levi and I were talking about it afterwards and how it was very strange how God manifested himself that way that day to me. That it was just, I could feel myself walking the Spirit of God everywhere I went. It was not in that place. It was, some people find, find God there. I have no doubt about that. Many walk him through that door like we did. But it was dark and oppressive and heavy and ugly and I was shocked at that. Absolutely shocked at that. The best part was outside the door. Tell them about what was written outside the holy door. Yeah, as you walk into the door, there, there's, there's a special door that's opened only on certain years, and it's called the holy door. And, but it says there's a sign, and it's written there in, in probably eight different languages. And it says, this is the holy door, the only way of access, what is it, to the presence of God through Jesus Christ. It's just real clear. It made it very, clear. very, very clear. And it's written like in Japanese and Chinese and Arabic and German and French and Spanish and on and on and on. And it was just like, boom, very short, sweet, right to the point. It's like, okay, if you were here just for the visit, right there is the witness. And it was like the most directed witness there that we felt. But, you know, here's the danger, right? Where do we go to seek the presence of God? And how strong... How do we honor our traditions without being captured by them? And you really see it here in this place. But we have to be so aware of how anything that we walk in can become that. And there's always dangers involved in the way that we try to blend and over honor certain things. So out in the courtyard, here's Peter. I kind of actually like his his statue. The one of Paul looks pretty ticked off and he's got a sword. But I like Peter because, you know, in some ways I identify more with Peter because open your mouth first and think second, you know. I just, I just like his ability to, to get out there and do it. Passionate, often wrong, but never in doubt. I mean, he's a guy I, I enjoy. Um, too often I'm like him, I think. And then in the middle of this courtyard also you have this obelisk. Okay? Now, let me show you something because I'm not showing you the whole picture because on top of this obelisk, they've put this. This was the most profound thing in some ways I saw. We were listening to a little bit of a recorded tape and he talked about this small cross that was supposed to show the victory over the paganism. And yet I thought, oh Lord, but... <laughs> and the commentator, this guy who done the tape, who's not a believer, said, it just shows you how Christianity is really built on the foundation of all this paganism. And it's just wow. stuck on top. But you know what? Look at this. You know? It's going like, well, wait a minute. 
What is this even doing in the middle of St. Peter's Square? Yeah, it's like the most prominent thing there. Okay. It's there and it's upright. I would be okay if it's there a lot that it was laying down and in pieces. Okay? Yeah, if it was leaning over. And this actually is a relic that was brought over. Okay? And it's to show that, okay, Nero didn't win, we won. Well, that's one heck of a way to do it. <laughs> Let's throw this big obelisk up. But God's sense of humor in the midst of this, right? You know what Peter, right? I showed you this Peter sitting there, right? I didn't show you the whole picture I got because the reason I love this picture, because again, God's sense of humor, okay, church wants to do that and try to do that. Let me do this with one of the leaders. <laughs> That's a pigeon. You, you, come on, right? This is God saying, now don't get overwhelmed with the saint stuff. <laughs> Let me put him back in perspective. Okay? Do you understand? We walked out those huge, mass, those massive cathedral doors, and there's Peter with a pigeon on his head. You know? It's just like, okay. Thank you, Lord. The, 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 Thank you, Lord. the keys, yeah. the keys, which represent the king, keys of the kingdom, right? That Jesus says, I'm going to give to the church. And we misunderstand sometimes Petros and Petra about Peter and his role is critical. It's built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, but the rock is about who Jesus is. And, but, oh well, okay, so, but they got some of the understanding of, of authority there. But I love this pigeon. It's just like, you know what, and that's God's creation. And he's just going like, okay, guys, don't take yourself too seriously. So, so both of them have a pigeon on them? Both of them have, yeah, you know, I, I just kind of showing you how, God's counterbalancing saying, okay, you're going to mess with this, let me mess with you a little bit. Okay? I just, Jehovah funny, you know, he's just there. Okay? So, and then you go to the Pantheon, which is thousands of years old, right? And you go inside, and it's the largest, it's one of the largest domes ever made. Do you know that opening is completely open to sky? You know how wide it is across there? 35 feet. That opening is wider than this room, and then some. Okay? And that big, huge dome, you can't even quite see it when you look back on this part. But see that barrel structure? Mm -hmm. Is what, at, at the biggest base of it, was it 13 or 26 feet thick? And then it gets the, the dome itself and gets thinner up. Because the thing's thousands of years old. And of course, it was the Pantheon. It was to all of the gods. So nobody got ticked off. But surprisingly, okay. it felt more, it felt cleaner than St. Peter's did. Sure. When you go in, because inside, all this light's coming right in. And now the church has tried to again dress it up and the take it over, it up you know, spiritually cleaned it up. and and done stuff. But then you got a, a dead pope buried over here. Really, I mean, he's actually right there. You know, I mean, he's encased, but he's you're kind of like, okay, why do you seek the living among the dead? It's a little bit different. So you do that, but then you step out the doors, and lo and behold, what would you put out there? Oh yes, another muzzle. Okay. Another one. And of course, let's put on the star on top. There it goes, okay? That is actually there. I just was hiding it for a second. <laughs> they were all over the place. They were all over, okay? It's like, you know what? These things need to be down on their sides and broken up so that we understand the victory. Go ahead, David. You know, I have a lot of fun shots that I could show you, but I'm just going to, just I'm just touching on some things here. This place really was intense for me, the Colosseum. Do you realize that... Um, this was so popular that there, they had sports promotion. You could buy, they found goblets with the names of famous gladiators on them. They were selling Nike stuff back then, you know, the Michael Jordan brand, okay. It's estimated that around 400,000 men and women and children lost their lives in this place. I could go on and on, but this structure here housed 80 elevators where they would pop up on unsuspecting whoever's, wild animals, other soldiers, any number of other things. Okay? It was quite a thing and there's, there's all sorts more that you could go there. But I just want, I just give you a quick snapshot of that. I walked around this stuff, the movie Gladiator. I don't know if you've seen that, but that is actually a parable about Jesus. The general, okay, who became a slave, took on the form of a servant. Slave who became a gladiator. Gladiator means swordsman. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but to bring a sword. And the gladiator who defied an empire.
Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. Okay, and then you go back at night and they put on this whole laser show. This is one of my shots of the Colosseum at night. Okay, it's amazing, it's dramatic, right? But then in the midst of that, there is this cross. Again, God's saying, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm here. In the midst of this, I'm here. And they put it up to honor what first they thought were all of the victims, and then they discovered most of them actually hadn't happened there. They got their history right. And then outside, yet another reminder, this is a, an arch, a triumphant arch, put up there by, lo and behold, Constantine, whom I won't go into depth about here now because most of you know about it, but for some of those who maybe knew watching on the web, you need to dig into that. And we got into bed with Constantine or Constantine with the church, and we thought it was a good idea at the time, but he used it to gut a lot of our connections with our roots and understanding. So Rome is a magnificent place but in many ways, it's New York City with history, okay? The graffiti was a lot of places. I'm showing you the kind of the pretty parts right now, the kind of touristy stuff and everything. But when you walk it at night, some of it shifts a lot. But what you're very clear upon is that it is an empire that is no more. And the church that tried to ride alongside of that and come in political power and ride it and now there's a tremendous amount of structures and there's a lot of land holding, but a lot of the vitality has been lost. Okay? And this stuff just starts to imprint and imprint and imprint. And here is part of the forum you can walk through, right? It's a huge area that you can tour of all the ruins of Rome, the po most powerful empire. And so years ago, this guy, British historian Edward Gibbon, wrote a six-volume complete source on the history of decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And it included a scathing view of Christianity. He was no way considered a Christian, just so you know, in terms of his approach. But I want to show you the five primary reasons he said that the Roman Empire fell. And then you just see if it connects the dot anywhere. The rapid increase of divorce with the undermining of the family structure. Uh, it's just them. Second, higher and higher taxes and spending of public money on bread and circuses. That's literally. Okay, the entertainment of the masses, the gladiator things and everything. Okay, keep them entertained, keep them fed, and you keep them under control. No, no parallels. The mad craze for pleasure, sports becoming every year more exciting and more brutal. This just, I just, just write, this was written back in the 1700s. The building of gigantic armies to fight external enemies when the most deadly enemy, the decadence of the people lay within. By the way, the reason they had to do this is because they kept extending the empire beyond their capacity to control it. Because the larger you become, your interests, the more diverse they are, the more you have to start protecting them all and they get you spread too thin. And then finally, this is his fifth thing, the decay of religion, faith fading into mere form, losing touch with life, and becoming impotent to guide it. Okay. So, in walking around in the midst of, of Rome, I'm sitting there going, boy, amazing empire, amazing stuff, etc., etc. And I see also a manifestation when the church loses a focus on the core of the gospel and we become concerned about building reminders and memorials to our own work. And it started as a good idea at the time. Okay, but that's only connected. By the way, then I get home and the next day I get this email from Barna, which is titled, The End of Absolutes, America's New Moral Code. Very interesting. What's he, what, what, what do they got? A map. A map. Okay. See, God uses these little things to like connect the dots. Okay, Stephen, you've been thinking about Google Maps, about this. So listen to this. So let me just give you a couple things here. This is the percentage now of that believe the moral truth is relative. Elders and boomers, you pretty much know who those are going to be 39 to 41% believe truth is relative. In other words, they're going to believe there is some absolute truth. When you get to the millennials, it's 51% think it's relative. That's just, this is within the United States. Agree the best way to find yourself is by looking just within yourself. All adults are at 91%. Practicing Christians. Yeah, practicing Christians is 76 a biblical worldview, right, looking outside so that we have that anchoring, using the GPS to make sure where we are and keep tracking with that, is we're in a culture, the reason I'm bringing this is because I felt like God threw us in Italy for two weeks in order to imprint the fact that get used to it feeling foreign and don't freak out by it because I've got things for you to do. 
Because frankly, personally, it's feeling more foreign. <laughs> and I can't get disheartened about it only because God's not upset in terms of, of he's not, I don't want to use the wrong word. God is not afraid. Okay? God is in a good mood because he knows where this all goes. Okay. Quickly, here's one of the questions. Whatever is right for your life or works best for you is the only truth you can know. When you get to millennials, it's 74% agree with that. Gen Xers, 69, and it backs up from there. Here's this one. Every culture must determine what is acceptable morality for its people. 60% of elders, 60 boomers, 67 Gen Xers, and 70% of millennials. The, the loss of a biblical worldview. Right? Now you have to be reasonable in how is it applied, right? You cannot be legalistic, but the principles there in terms of valuing and honoring of life, of people, of relationships, etc. It's all there. This one, the Bible provides us with moral truths which are the same for all people in all situations without exception. Mm -hmm. And you can see that agree strongly or somewhat when you get to millennials, you're only at like 29 and 27 percent. So you do get up to 54 total moral truths which are the same for all people without exception. Moses said, I've been a sojourner in a foreign land. Okay? And we're told this phrase over and over again. So, let me just, I'm going to run you through some other stuff because this is getting too long. But I wanted to just, I wanted to give you, I have, I'm, I took a lot of pictures and I'm giving you bits. But here is the Pantheon outside at night, right? But here's what I actually got was this. A full moon coming up. Because see, what God keeps doing, and you're going to see this later, in that he kept bringing jet streams across. I'd be somewhere and there'd be a jet stream, you know what I mean by that, a jet trail up in the sky. And when I came the first morning and we got home, that morning I got up and I went out and there's this beautiful sunrise coming up and there's a jet going overhead. And I'm going, okay, God, part of what you're telling me is you keep, you are not leaving yourself without a witness. Okay, you think you've built this great montage? Let me put this little dot in the sky and by the way, let me change every ocean in the world and pull it towards me. You think that's powerful? You think that's impressive? Watch this. This little light in the sky, <laughs> gonna change the tides, right? And he kept doing this thing. And, and here, yeah, here's this guard. You can hardly see him, right? This, the Swiss guard at this huge door. And it's impressive and it's colorful and everything else. But then I took this picture. And it's like, okay, here's God's version. <coughs> Clothed more magnificently than the Pope or the king or anybody else yeah. are the flowers of the fields. And they will remain. They will be destroyed They'll like the flower, flower fades. But it will come up again. And the Colosseum, the sign of all that decadence, is just in ruination. And now it's a, it, it's a spectacle. It's, it's an amazing structure, but it's, God's got the new things. And some dress this way in Rome, and some dress this way. Dude. That sign says, dude. dude. <laughs> These guys are both walking in the Vatican area. And it was just sort of an interesting... Because I'm just fascinated with people. They're like about the same age, very different girth. But this one guy with a wearing this and dude, but he's got the cross on there. You know, so I'm like, okay, you know what? Different ways. And, and all this painting and ornamentation over doorways and entrances and everything else. And God says, okay, let me show you another way to do it. Boom. Do you see what I'm saying? God is just, just and I love architecture and fine art. It, it's just, it, it draws me, but, I, I, but it's just, it just has to bow before the Creator. <laughs> right? I mean, Esther is an artist. She knows this. So, okay, so just to quickly, this is a whole other place, right? We went, we drove up, we rented a car, which is a very dangerous thing to do in Italy. Because you have to drive like the Italians. So, you know, one hand on the horn and one in the air. Hey! Okay, no. Actually, it's, it's really fun because I understand I grew up where Mario Andretti was one of the fast drivers and you knew he was Italian and now I understand why because you get up there and it's just, it's, you know, and the, 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 uh, the dividing lines in the freeway, they're, they're, they're more like guidelines than actual <laughs> spaces. It's true, right? We're driving on one guy and it's like, okay, that's just, it's just. So here, so we build these things. This is actually up in a separate province. Um, What's it called? San Marino. Sa thank you. San Marino just went bleh. So, impressive thing on top of this, and God goes, okay, well, that's good, but watch this. 
Let's get the setting right. Yeah, the reason you put it here is because I created the mountain and the rocks. You just happen to chip away at a few things and put them together. So don't get overly impressed. And then up on top of this, so now, oops, that wait. That was actually the, on the east coast of um, Italy. It's a republic. It's one of the oldest republics in the world. It's actually its own small country in Italy. Oh, yeah. so, Levi actually went to the tourism office and got his passport stamped because you, you can do that there as a separate country. And it's this beautiful little thing that we didn't even know about it. We were just kind of, you know, we, before we went, we heard about it. And so, you know, up on this, in the same place, they have yet again another chapel and stuff. And so it's like, okay, let's build this huge monument. And God goes, okay, that's fine, but let me do this for fun. <laughs> right? There's a bicycle hung up on the wall. It's just growing right over it. Okay? And there's a, there's a little cafe above it. And it's just, uh, this screen, I'm, unfortunately, the, the image gets degraded a lot because of the pixelation. I wish you could see what I'm seeing because it's, it's beautiful. Or, you know, we put up this great tower and we go, wow, aren't we great? And God goes, yeah, well, I'm greater. Because look what I did. And yours only looks good or works good because I did this. Right? And that was kind of the theme. And so the most we can hope to do usually is to frame the view for what God's really done. Right? And this is the challenge in the church because too often in the church we get really excited about what we're doing to try to honor God. But meanwhile, then we stand up honoring mostly ourselves and our own work, whether it's a program or a campaign or something. And this shot kind of captured it in this great fortress. So, okay, there's so much we could show you. But then you go to, to Venice, and we were there, and we rented another apartment for three days. And we lived in a place that was built in the 1400s. Okay? And I'll just, I don't want to show you stuff, but you, you there are no streets, right? Those of you know that. There's water buses. And so you use those. You get a pass. And just as you go, there's just remarkable views because the setting is so extraordinary. Hmm. And you're just like, wow, God, this is... And then you go at night and it changes again. And this is just shot from the bus. <laughs> the boat bus? The boat bus. What's your view like on the bus, right? So, again, it's, it's amazing. It's beautiful. It's... Uh, it's busy. We actually stayed. This, this was the view out our one of the apartment windows. You know? And part of it looks like it's falling down because it is. Right? Venice is slowly sinking into the water. And this place, the entrance door, actually you came in and then there was a step down and another place to go right out to the water. So in the days when it was a big estate or something, you could drive your boat right up there. So there was a working canal right below this, this window. And we would hear the boats going by. No, no, no tourist stuff. These guys were delivering stuff. They were doing construction and taking their garbage men. Garbage men. I mean, this wow. on their thing, doing their thing. So they do that. But you, you catch so you catch these moments of, of tremendous beauty. Look at the wrought iron, the wrought iron on this window, right? It just sort of captures you. And the contrast of the old and the new. This very sleek and this very established. Just kind of jump out at you. And then you watch for things. And this is on a water bus. Can you see that? That's a puppy in there. This guy comes in on the water bus carrying this puppy on the bag. And he's just got him one hand on him. You know, it's just like, okay, this is completely cool. Because they take their dogs everywhere there. It's like France. The dogs are really welcome. So they're in the stores. They're in the restaurants. And we're huge dog people. So we're like, okay, can we pet, can we pet them? That's, that's, that's what we do. So for us, we just pay attention to that. Here's something else. This was out on Murano. This is a huge glass sculpture and a bell tower there. But then back in, in the apartment we were, here was a, just an eight-inch sculpture of a lion who you know is one of my most favorite because the Lion of Judah. Okay? And I, I, I didn't put him in, but God just kept showing picture after picture of lion after lion after lion, whether it was a door ringer or a doorknob or a sculpture. The presence of the Lion of Judah was just well, everywhere there. Like and so, his head was bowed and his eyes were closed. Yeah, you know, it's, it was a very gentle. And so when we came in, you know, again, you come in the front door of this place and you're kind of like, uh-oh, did I? <laughs> I won't show you right now. It comes off this little bridge right there and it's like, okay, is this going to be okay? And it was great. And then again, I love this because this is God saying, okay, you're impressed with all your stuff. Let me show you this. Because I'm going to refresh this again. And greater beauty. And then this is in one of our windows. The succulents and the wrought iron. And there's, there's the, uh, one of the canals down in the back there. 
So, and I love just pictures of iron that's been there since 1700s, helping to reinforce something on one of these walkway bridges. And then we go to Florence, and of course Florence is all about the dome, right? Which is what? Kim, just tell them briefly. It is the, how big a dome is it? It's the biggest dome in the world. The biggest dome in the world. Okay. It's a dome inside a dome, okay. actually. And Kim read a whole book on it. And it's, it's massive, it's the largest one in the world. When you go down there, this is what this looks like from the front. It is remarkable and ornate. So just pictures of it inside, looking up, okay? I could just go on and on and on. But then again, we rent a department. We wanted to be out of the tourists, but this was the view from the garden. Okay? And this was the garden that we got. And it was a little too better place. And again, spent a lot less. You, God's good. He, he directed. And I wasn't even expecting this. It was turn of the century place. Had all these great doors and, and in it and everything. But you, you look at the dome. And by the way, just to get an idea, can you see what looks like little ants at the very top? Those are people. You can walk inside the dome to give you an idea of that. So I've zoomed in on that. But we get very impressed about the dome and the architecture when we wrote it. And God says, okay, you're impressed with that. Let me give you another dome. So out in our backyard... <laughs> After we had coffee, and I had read about this in one of the reviews, didn't know if it was still true or not, we're having our coffee and stuff like this, and all of a sudden these turtles start emerging. Biggest one is about that big, smallest one is about that big. And they start showing up, and there's five of them. And they're out there, and they're feeding, and, and so it's, it's just like God was setting this contrast, saying, okay, until, don't get overexcited with what you think you've done. Let me show you how it's supposed to be, okay? <laughs> And so it just on and on, by the way, whose dome do you really care about, right? This, anyway, close up. So, and then there's, of course, this is Statue of David. This is at the, um, the plaza of Michelangelo. It was built by uh, Giuseppe Poggi back in like 1839. This is a bronze, huge bronze statue of David, right? That's standing up there and it's got this tremendous view of all of, of Florence. Okay, well we got up there because I had read something about you really want to be there at a sunset. And this is when God starts to show off again. And so all these people gather to see the sunset. I mean, it's a huge crowd that gather up there. We were able, God just opened up a parking space because it was last minute. And we just slammed in there right there. And there's a first parking space is open. I mean, there's very little parking there. And we go, to God, I need a parking space if we're going to get the shot, you know? <laughs> okay. But what happens there is, can you see which way David is looking? It's all but at the sunset. It's really interesting. And this picture probably makes it better. And so it's like even this great work that everybody come to see, including Florence, and what happened when the sun went down is spontaneous applause. Just broke out. People just started clapping. And it was like, go God. <laughs> so there you are, sitting over one of the most beautiful cities in the world by one of the best known pieces of artwork in the world, Michelangelo's David. Okay? And God shows up with yet another sunset and the world breaks into applause. And there were, you can't see it, but there were hundreds of people there. Hundreds of people. Wow. Okay? So... I was taking pictures over this, you can't really see, but the dome is in the background, but I was just trying to, I, I kind of wanted to see how this would work to get that. And so I thought, well, I'll put this other little flower up here. So I was taking a picture of this flower with the sh in the distance and everything else. And I go, wait a minute. And I just took the shot and I'm looking at it to see if I caught it. And lo and behold, there is this spider in the middle of it. And God's like, okay, and I'm going to God like, okay, you're just showing off now, aren't you? <laughs> right? Because you know, I'm, I'm impressed with taking this so that there's a dome in the background. God's like, okay. Get over yourself. Are you getting me? I have a gazillion shots of different angles and stuff because it's just, it's very compelling. And then we end up with a stopover in Copenhagen. So we take the train over to Sweden to Malmo. I have birth roots at Malmo. My father's family um, immigrated from Sweden to Canada and then eventually Canada to the U.S. My, my dad was the only brother of the brothers and sisters born in the U.S. The rest were born in Canada. Because Canada was giving a thousand acres free to anyone who would homestead it. And that's why they immigrated. Um, and so we have this great big, in the middle of Malmo, there's, there's yet another cathedral. But it's interesting because 
this would have been connected with what we call the Catholic Church, but in the Reformation, right? As you know, North divided out. So when you go inside, it's a very different feel. There's a great deal of feeling of space and air, and it just gets white. And suddenly it's like, okay, I'm feeling a little bit more <laughs> comfortable now because it's calling me up, but it's not so distracting. I've not got all that stuff. But I will say the front altar is pretty amazing, but Levi notices that on the altar panels you have the Last Supper, the next one the Crucifixion, then you have the Resurrection, and then finally the Ascension. You have those stages are presented right there. Now I will tell you one thing too, as someone who moves in the Word of God, this is the pulpit. And there's a whole back step entry to that. And one of my personal things is that I, those who teach have to take a firm awareness of how we're held accountable for it. I feel like if you preached out of this, you would really be aware of that. <laughs> really be aware of it. Anyway, just the idea of, of again, the heavens, but now it's, it just felt cleaner and more open. And what was interesting is you're leaving the church on the way on the back door, there are these two clear stained glasses, Alpha Omega. And there's a flower there and there's a sword. And then set right in between these two, because I couldn't get, the, I took the, each individually, but set in between. Can you read what this says? <laughs> Yahweh. It's Hebrew. In a Gothic church in Sweden. God is keeping his witness there. But then meanwhile, I go outside to make some shots. And once again, I go, okay, you're just showing off again, aren't you, God? Kind of like, you think this is some great structure? Let me show you what I can do. Whoosh. Let me show you where the color really is. Okay, you get a little glimpse of this? So, tourist or homebody, we're not supposed to be either. We're supposed to be a sojourner with a heart set on pilgrimage. You get that? Okay. Fear of loss or control, fear of loss of control leads to house arrest. But Proverbs says, a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Levi just ran across that this week and said, hey, this was helpful. We're commanded to go and engage, not sit back. Googling God has to be the norm. When you're traveling and you don't know what something is, and by the way, what is, how did bidets come to exist? We had a whole thing. We had a day. We, we joked about calling bidet for, for, for dummies. <laughs> so you Google bidet, right? And you get all this information that you didn't have before because you're moving somewhere and something is foreign to you. We are going to be in an environment where continually we're going to get more and more foreign things going and you're going to have to be better at Googling God. So God, what are you thinking about this? Do you understand? We have to get better. We're going to have to be better more and more in tune to what the Spirit is saying and we're going to have to become more and more biblically literate because we're increasingly in a foreign land. And you know what though? The church thrived in a foreign land. The danger is when the church got co-opted with the government, mm -hmm. frankly. Lost its distinctiveness. So it has to because as we become, things become more foreign, we become much, we rely more deeply on God. As more is unknown, we have to become more biblical. The danger in where we seek God and why, because those amazing places, like most projects, started with good or great intentions, but, right, then they become an ending of themselves. And the danger, if you don't think this, this is really where you gotta watch. It's as real today as anywhere. Yeah. We found that in many of those incredible cathedrals and buildings and museums and things, we were constantly having to push back the darkness. Yeah. We were constantly having to pray back the deaf spirits yeah. and the heaviness in those places just to even be able to breathe and continue to walk forward. And that was, it was a lot of work. Yeah. It was a lot of work yeah. wherever we went. And even coming home here, I noticed the first two nights I was home, I had terrible nightmares. And I rarely ever have a nightmare. And I mean, I would, had to get up. I was so freaked out. And it wasn't until I think this morning I was telling Stephen about that. And we began to pray and clear this space out. And one of the things that he told me was left behind here was came home with us was a Venetian spirit. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what that is, oh, but I don't want that in my house because it did not feel good. Mm -hmm. It did not feel good. So it, it was a lot of work to constantly push back the darkness, the death spirits, all that stuff away from us. I thought, my goodness, we, everywhere we went, we prayed for the people that we saw. We prayed for the people that were 
seeking God in those structures, you know, that were rubbing their hands all over everything they could and kissing everything they could and, you know, crying out for God. And we were praying for them. And I'm like, Lord, clear the way. Let them feel you beyond all this stuff. You know, and when you walk out the door, and you just, at that point, it's like, oh, Lord, there you are. There you are. I remember now. There you are. But anyway, it was just a lot of work. One question. Kim and Levi could answer this. Every time before we left, I would ask them one thing. What was it? Do you have? What would I ask? Passport. Okay. I said, Anything else you might leave, we can replace. Do you have your passport? Okay. It's the one mandated question at each transition, and it needs to be that way for us too. What does your passport establish? What does it say? Access. It declares who you are and to whom you belong. Do you have your passport? Right? As a believer, that's going to be increasingly important at every transition. Do you have your passport, right? Into the portal to get past, covered by the blood, I'm there. I know that just sort of, it's our identity, it's our first alignment, our first citizenship. Right? We need to be honorable citizens of this nation, but first and foremost, of the kingdom of God. It's the only way we can be honorable to the nation. Otherwise, we won't help it. We'll only hurt it. How we need saints. We need those saints, but the problem is that the saints so often that we saw had been elevated up to now where they're intermediaries between that person and God. Does the church do it today? The Protestant church. How does it do it today? The, I'm sorry? The laity and the priesthood. Or, you know, well, my pastor said, well, this apostle or this, you know what, you got to be very, very cautious in that. We need them. They're great examples, but they're bad intermediary, intermediaries, and they're dangerous to have anyone as an idol. Okay, still goes on. Balance to honor your history, but don't be trapped by it. You got that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The danger of, of how that works. Behold, I do a new thing, and I do it new each and every morning. God's warped sense of humor. He's playing with you. Okay? He does this so we won't take ourselves so seriously. So let me just loop back on a, on a couple examples. One, of course, was Peter. Two was going through this, this gallery that was quite expensive in Florence and not really seen. And then suddenly we came around the corner, and this is the portrait of Doubting Thomas. It was the best thing in the whole gallery. But, but, gallery. but here he is. You know, if you've seen this portrait before, I've shown it, actually. But there we are with it. But, you know, it's actually kind of a funny thing because think about the story. Jesus is going, okay, Thomas, stick your hand in here. Uh, what? I don't think so, right? It's just, it, you kind of have to get the humor. And while we're waiting in line at this gallery, I look up and there's all these wonderful busts, and a lot of them have halos, you know, behind the, the thing, relief. But then I look up and I go, oh my goodness, he's wearing Mickey Mouse ears. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's kind of like the lion in The Wizard of Oz. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, this is what? Okay. Do you see this humor of God? Do you see the parallel here and here? Okay. Unless you guys get too hauled up about all your holiness, whether you're Peter or some other, I don't know who this other person was up in the bust, but he clearly deserved a halo, but it's, God's just like having fun. And it just happened to be where we were standing that it looked like Mickey Mouse ears. Okay, have you got it? A little bit of that. So what's happening is God's continuing to press experiences that I walk through there and, and show me in the spirit what he's saying. Sojourners. Google Maps. Only it's going to be God, Godel Maps or something. I don't know. <laughs> work with me here. Okay. It's going to be about remembering the foreignness. Don't be alarmed by that understand it is there are sanctuary places that God will have for us as you move forward okay where he will remind you of what's important like turtle shells in the place of domes okay and flowers in the places of Colosseums okay all this stuff that he will do to remind and I wanted to show you that too because so many people want to go and see all these wonderful things and meanwhile God is sitting there going, well, I know that's impressive, but this is even more so. And so the most impressive shots I got, I think, were of flowers and of stalks of things and iron. And, you know, that's where it's like, okay, wow. But it takes me slowing down because I'm in a foreign land to actually notice that stuff because I'm blown by it all day long here. 
It's not like they got more pretty flowers in Italy. Give me a break. We had almost the same exact setup there that we have here. <laughs> so God is just saying, I'm here, I'm present, I'm with you in this journey. Take heart. Father, we just we take this word now. I hope something of you was in this. Lord, let each take the word you had for them to be encouraged and challenged. Lord, we are not to be ugly tourists. We're not to be stuck at home. We're to be out and about. This group is aligned in you by your word, by the spirit. They've been briefed. They know that the world is changing, but they are change agents. They're not to hide and wait. They're to be present. They're to be looking for your sense of humor in the midst of things so they don't take themselves too seriously and they watch for your creative hand. Father, I thank you for the spontaneous applause that broke out over just another sunset for you. I thank you for the moon that you stuck over the Pantheon to say, you think that's power? Watch this. <laughs> Lord, thank you that you are Jehovah Sneaky. Thank you that you are at work in all of us for a manifest destiny that we have still yet to see. Thank you that your word is alive and active. And we seal this up now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.